Jaeger, and this is my son. My name is Colin Jaeger. And we're going to read about Paddington Bear, and this is actually a chapter out of a larger book. Um, the book's called Paddington Treasury, and it's by Michael Bond. And the reason that we chose this book was because um, when I was growing up, I read about Paddington because my parents were from Scotland, and Paddington was very popular in Scotland. And fortunately, Colin enjoyed Paddington stories as well. So we're going to start off with a chapter about who Paddington is, and I'm going to start to read. Please look after this bear. Mr. and Mrs. Brown first met Paddington on a, rail, on a railway platform. In fact, that was how he came to have such an unusual name for a bear, for Paddington was the name of the station. Mrs. Brown was there to meet their daughter, Judy, who was coming home from school for the holidays. It was a warm summer day, and the station was crowded with people on their way to the seaside. Trains were humming, loudspeakers blaring, porters rushing around, shouting at one another, and altogether, there was so much noise that Mr. Brown, who first saw the bear, told his wife several times before she understood. A bear on Paddington Station. Mrs. Brown looked at her husband in amazement. Don't be silly, Henry. That can't be. Mr. Brown adjusted his glasses. But there it is, he insisted. <clears throat> I distinctly saw it over there near the bicycle rack. It was wearing a funny kind of a hat. Without waiting for a reply, he cut hold of his wife's arm and pushed her towards the uh, pushed her through the crowd, round a cart laid a cart laden with chocolate and cups of tea, past a bookstall and through a gape, like, sorry, a gap and a pile of suitcases towards the the lost property office. <clears throat> there you are, he announced triumphantly, pointing towards the dark corner. I told you so. Mrs. Brown followed the direction of his arm and dimly made out a small, furry object in the shadows. It seemed to be sitting on some kind of suitcase, and round its neck was a label with some writing on it. The suitcase, was, the suitcase was old and battered, and on the side, in large letters, were the words, Wanted on Voyage. Mrs. Brown clutched at her husband. Why, Henry, she exclaimed. I believe you are right after all. It is a bear. She peered at it more closely. It seemed a usual kind of bear. It was brown in color, a rather dirty brown and it was wearing a most odd-looking hat with a wide brim, just as Mr. Brown had said. From beneath the brim, two large round eyes stared back at her. Seeing that something was expected of it, the bear stood up and politely raised its hat, revealing two black ears. Good afternoon, it said in a small, clear voice. Er, good afternoon, replied Mr. Brown doubtfully. There was a moment of silence. The bear looked at them inquiringly. Can I help you? Mr. Brown looked rather embarrassed. Well, no. Uh, as a matter of fact, we were wondering if we could help you. Mrs. Brown bent down. You're a very small bear, she said. The bear puffed out his chest. I'm a very rare sort of bear, it replied importantly. There aren't many of us left where I come from. And where is that, asked Mrs. Brown. The bear looked around carefully before replying, Peru. I'm not really supposed to be here at all. I'm a stowaway. A stowaway, Mr. Brown lowered his voice and looked anxiously over his shoulder. He almost expected to see a policeman standing behind him with a notebook and pencil taking everything down. Yes, said the bear. I immigrated, you know. A sad expression came onto his eyes. I used to live with my Aunt Lucy in Peru, but she had to go into a home for retired bears. You don't mean to say you've come all the way from South Africa by yourself, explained Mrs. Brown. The bear nodded. Aunt Lucy always said she wanted me to immigrate when I was old enough. That's why she taught me to speak English. But whatever did you do for food? Asked Mr. Brown. You must be starving. Bending down, the bear unlocked the suitcase with a small key, which it also had around, had around its neck, and brought out an almost empty glass jar. I ate marmalade. It was rarely, it was rather, I ate marmalade rather proudly. Bears like marmalade, and I lived in a lifeboat. But what are you going to do now, said Mr. Brett, asked Mr. Brown. You can't just sit on this Paddington station waiting for something to happen. Oh, I shall be all right, I expect. The bear bent down to do up to, do up to the suitcase again, and it and is, and it, sorry, as it did so, Mrs. Brown caught a glimpse of writing on the label. It said simply, please look after this bear. Thank you. 
She turned appealingly to her husband. Oh, Henry, what shall we do? We can't just leave him here. There's no knowing what might happen to him. London's such a big place when you've got nowhere to go. Can he come and stay with us for a few days? Mr. Brown hesitated. But Mary, dear, we can't take him. Not just like that. After all, after all what? Mrs. Brown's voice had a firm note to it. She looked down at the bear. He is rather sweet, and to be such company for Jonathan and Judy, even if he's only for a little while. They never forgive you if they knew you left him here. It seems highly irregular, said Mr. Brown doubtfully. I'm sure there's a law about it. He bent down. Would you like to come and stay with us, he asked. That is, he added hastily, not wishing to offend the bear, if you got nothing else planned. The bear jumped, and his hat nearly fell off with excitement. Oh, yes, please, I should like that very much. I've nowhere to go, and everyone seems in such a hurry. Well, that's settled then, said Mrs. Brown. Before her husband could change his mind, and you can have marmalade for breakfast every morning, and she tried hard to think of something else that bears might like. Every morning, the bear looked as if he could hardly believe his ears. I only had on special occasions at home. Marmalade's very expensive in darkest Peru. Then you shall have it every morning, starting tomorrow, continued Mrs. Brown, and honey on Sunday. A worried expression came over the bear's face. Will it cost very much, he asked. You see, I haven't very much money. Of course not. We wouldn't dream of charging you anything at all. We shall expect you to become one of the family, shan't we, Henry? Mrs. Brown looked at her husband for support. Of course, said Mr. Brown. By the way, he added, if you are coming home with us, you better know our names. This is Mrs. Brown, and I'm Mr. Brown. The bear raised his hat politely twice. I haven't really got a name, he said, only a Peruvian one, which no one can understand. Then we better give you an English one, said Mrs. Brown. It'll make things much easier. She looked around the station for inspiration. It ought to be something special, she said thoughtfully. As she spoke, an engine standing at one end of the platforms gave a loud wail, and a train began to move. I know what, she exclaimed. We found you on Paddington Station, so we'll call you Paddington. Paddington, the bear repeated several times to make sure. It seems a very long name. Quite distinguished, said Mr. Brown. Yes, I like Paddington as a name. Paddington it shall be. Mrs. Brown stood up. Good. Now, Paddington, I have to go meet our little daughter, Judy, as she gets off the train. She's coming home from school. I'm sure you must be thirsty after your long journey. So you go along to the cafe with Mr. Brown, and he'll buy you a nice cup of tea. Paddington licked his lips. I'm very thirsty, he said. Seawater makes you thirsty. He picked up his suitcase, pulled his hat down firmly over his head, and waved a paw politely in the direction of the cafe. After you, Mr. Brown. Here, oh, thank you, Paddington, said Mr. Brown. Now, Henry, look after him. Mrs. Brown called after them, and for goodness sake, when you get a moment, take the label off his neck. It makes him look like a parcel. I'm sure he'll get put in a luggage van or something if a porter sees him. The cafe was crowded when they entered, but Mr. Brown managed to find a table for two in the corner. By standing on the chair, Paddington could rest his paws comfortably on the glass top. He looked round with interest while Mr. Brown went to fetch some tea. The sight of everyone eating reminded him how hungry he felt. There was a half-eaten bun on the table, but just as he reached out his paw, a waitress came up and swept it away. You don't want to eat that, dearie, she said, giving him a friendly pat. You don't know where it's been. Paddington felt so empty he didn't really care where it had been, but he was much too polite to say anything. Well, Paddington, said Mr. Brown as he placed two steaming cups of tea and a pile and a plate piled high with pastries on the table. How will, how will this do? Paddington's eyes glistened. It's very nice, thank you, he explained, eyeing the tea doubtfully, but it's rather hard drinking out of a cup. I usually get my head stuck or else my hat falls into it and it makes a nasty mess. Mr. Brown hesitated. Well, then you'd better give me your hat. I'll pour the tea into the saucer for you. It's not like, it's not really done in the best circles, but I'm sure no one will mind if we do it this just once. Paddington removed his hat and laid it carefully on the table while Mr. Brown poured out the tea. He looked hungrily at the pastries, in particular at a large cream and jam one, which Mr. Brown placed in a plate in front of him. There you are, Paddington, he said. I'm sorry they haven't any marmalade ones, but these were the best I could get. I'm glad I emigrated, said Paddington as he reached out upon and pulled the plate nearer. Do you think anyone would mind if I sit on the table to eat? 
Before Mr. Brown could answer, he had climbed up and placed his right paw firmly on the bun. It was a very large bun, the biggest and stickiest Mr. Brown had been able to find. In a matter of moments, most of the inside found its way onto Paddington's whiskers. People started to nudge each other and began staring in their direction. Mr. Brown wished he had chosen a plain, ordinary bun, but he wasn't very experienced in the ways of bears. He stirred his tea and looked out the window, pretending he had a tea with a bear on Paddington Station every day of his life. Henry, the son of his wife's voice, brought him back to earth with a start. Henry, whatever are you doing to that poor bear? Look at him. He's covered all over with cream and jam. Mr. Brown jumped up in confusion. He seemed rather hungry, he answered lamely. Mrs. Brown turned to her daughter. This is what happens when I leave your father alone for five minutes. Judy clapped her hands excitedly. Oh, Daddy, is he really going to stay with us? If he does, said Mrs. Brown, I can see someone other than your father will have to look after him. Just look at the mess he's in. Paddington, who all this time had been too interested in his bun to worry about what was going on, suddenly became aware that people were talking about him. He looked up to see that Mrs. Brown had been joined by a little girl with laughing blue eyes and long fair hair. He jumped up, meaning to raise his hat, and in his haste slipped on a patch of strawberry jam that somehow or other had found its way onto the glass tabletop. For a brief moment, he had a dizzy impression of everything and everyone being upside down. He waved his paws wildly in the air, and then before anyone could catch him, he somersaulted backwards and landed with a splash in his saucer of tea. He jumped up even quicker than he had sat down, because the tea was still very hot, and promptly stepped into Mrs. Brown's cup. Judy threw back her, her head and laughed until the tears rolled down her face. Oh, Mommy, isn't it funny, she cried. Padding, Paddington, who didn't think it at all funny, stood for a moment with one foot on the table and the other in Mrs. Mr. Brown's tea. There were large patches of white cream all over his face, and on his left ear was a lump of, and on his left ear was a lump of strawberry jam. You wouldn't think, said Mrs. Brown, that anyone could get in such a state with just one bun. Mr. Brown coughed. He had just caught the stern eye of a waitress on the other side of the counter. Perhaps he said, "We'd better go. I'll see if I can find a taxi." He picked up Judy's belongings and hurried along. Paddington stepped gingerly off the table and with a last look at the sticky remains of his bun climbed down onto the floor. Judy took one of his paws. Come along, Paddington. We'll take you home and you can have a nice bath. Then you can tell me all about South Africa. I'm sure you must have had lots of wonderful adventures.